Let's stand this morning and welcome the Lord into our presence. Let's just all worship him and love him. How many came to worship him? Hallelujah. Now, to worship him means you've got to express something. The Bible said you express through the lifting up of hands. You express through clapping of hands. You express through singing. But somehow you have to make some kind of an expression because worship is never silent. There's noise in heaven, lots, of, lots and lots of noise. And, and if you don't become acquainted with that, you may not like heaven. You're certainly not going to like the other place. <laughs> when you consider the options, you know, there's not a lot to think about. We're here to worship. We're here to give God thanks, to give God praise. Let's pray. Let's give him praise in the house first. Ah, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship him. Father, we love you. We thank you. This is the day that you've made. What a wonderful day it is. God, the weather outside is inclement, but inside it is warm and expressive. And we are here to praise you, to give you glory, to give you praise, and to magnify the name that's above every name. We give you thanks. We worship you, Jesus. Speak into our spirit here this morning. Thank we'll you, God. And let Jesus take over. Give up and let Jesus take over. Jeez. 
Let's give him praise. Worship him. Worship him. Worship him. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. The kids are going to come and sing. Praise God. Okay, so it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and who knows we have the best pastor? Yes, we do. So our kids got something together for Pastor Lowe, and Lucy is going to read it. Our pastor is a sweetheart for everything he does. He is always there to pick the Reese's Pieces and answer our watch, whatchamacallits. Sometimes we act like airheads or nerds. And you probably think we are from the Milky Way, but you've made a mound of difference in our lives. Thank you for getting us in double mint condition for heaven, and thank you for making us smarties. You deserve 100 grand every payday. You will always be in our hearts now and later. so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me
I didn't know if I could get up here or not because I'm kind of bashful, <laughs> believe it or not. But I always remember what Brother Lowe says, step out of your comfort zone. And I'm so thankful for the three years I've been here, mo mostly because of you and my special, special father-in-law. I've known him for 27, 28 years, and he has been nothing but a great example to me where I started from. I am emotional about this because it, it means the world to me. Where I come from, I was so lost, so lost. And to find this family, starting with our head pastor, words can't even begin to say how much I love you guys. And I hope that shares between each one of us to love each other, to be there for each other, to support each other. These are things that our teacher is, we're his flock. He is our shepherd. Let's follow his teachings, learn from them, provide as an example. And God bless every one of you, okay? Let's appreciate these guys. If we, if we want to pay them back, let's do it with worship. Let's worship here today. Let's not sit. Let's worship God. Well, I didn't faint. appreciate our pastor, our senior pastor, and Brother Ferris, and Brother Jeremy. We all appreciate everything that they do. They're, they're there when we need them. Yes. Anytime we need something done, you know, we can, we can call on them. So I have a little poem. It's with appreciation for your ministry. What I pray for you, guidance, for the path your feet will daily follow. Wisdom, for the counsel you are asked to give. Compassion for those you are called upon to help. What I wish for you, strength, to stand for what is true and right, even when there is opposition. Courage to press on, even when things seem routine. Perseverance to follow the desires God has placed in your heart, even when you doubt. What I give to you, support for your leadership, appreciation for your calling and gifts, and thanks 
for the person you are in Christ. So God bless our pastors. I don't know if he has anything else to say, but I guess we'll let Brother Ferris take up the tithe and offering because we've got to pay bills. And, <laughs> and then we're going to take up then a, a, a pastor appreciation offering. So we're going to do that first. We're going to do our tithe and offering first. All right, you know, this is still part of worship in gi or giving. If you notice, the Old Testament is called a schoolmaster unto the new. Now, as it teaches us back then, even so continuing on into the New Testament, that we on the first day of the week should bring our first fruit offering, all that God has prospered you on the job or wherever you may be all week, all the blessings that God has prospered you, uh, you bring in a fruit offering or an offering of all your substance and give unto the kingdom work of God. And that's what we're doing this morning. And I was thinking about a message I heard about a real elderly minister a short time ago. And there was a missionary right after the Depression was ministering in his state. And he had came to town and he ministered on tithing. And there was a little young man there about 10 or 11 year old. And it being so briefly after the depression, he had no money. So he came and sought out that missionary the very next day and brung him a fish. That's all he had. Well, the missionary noticed that, you know, he come from a, a, a family. Nobody had anything back then. And he said, where is the other nine? He said, I haven't caught them yet. But he gave a first fruit offering, knowing and expecting that his father, the, his creator, his Lord, and his Savior was going to bless him with the other nine. So let us with faith this morning give into a seed offering as the ushers come in just a moment to receive and see if God will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. God bless you this morning. Good morning. God is good, isn't he? He's really, really good. This morning I want to deal with a question. Uh, we'll come back. I want to deal with a, with a very important question. Jesus asked this question. It's a question that he asked you to consider and think about. Not a question that I'm going to ask you. I'm just going to present his question to you. And that is from the book of Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. And here's what Jesus said. What shall it profit a man 
if he were to gain the whole world, I mean, if everything was at your fingertips, there was no limit to what you could buy, no limit to what you owned, everything was yours, everything, whatever you desired, whatever you laid your hands to, it was yours. What would it profit you if you had everything in this world's goods and lose your soul? Then the question remains from uh, further in the chapter, he says, what would you give in exchange for your soul? Now, there's a question I want to deal with this morning. What would you give in exchange for your soul? Of everything that you have this morning, whether it be your family, whether it be the place you live, whether it be what you're driving and everything that you own, the most thought-provoking, the most soul-stirring question that could ever be asked to you is, what shall it profit you if you gain it all and lose your soul? If in the end of this world you stand before God and find out that in all of your getting, everything that was important to you, you found out that nothing was really important except your finding God. What have you given? What have you traded out your soul for? What have you allowed to become so important to you that you were willing to risk your eternity, willing to risk your life, your soul, and your eternal existence? What would you give in exchange for your soul? I want to talk to you this morning about the value of the soul. The value of the soul. The soul that God has given you. The soul that God has made you responsible for. What would you give in exchange for your soul? There's three reasons that I want to address this topic here this morning. And one of those reasons is this. Number one, the soul is forever. The body that you're in is temporal and will only last for a while. But the real you that lives on the inside of this body will live forever and forever and forever and forever. We live and often what we live for from day to day is to try to satisfy and gratify the hungers of the flesh. What I can get, what is in it, what will give me a moment of pleasure, what will give me a moment of time that I can say, I had a good day or a good evening or a good whatever. What will I give in exchange for my soul? When I stand before God and I try to recount everything that has happened in my life and with my life, and I try to evaluate with Him and say, but God, my body was important, but God's going to say, you have known from the beginning that your body is perishable. It is not here for a permanent being. It is not here in a permanent existence. It is only here but for a moment of time. The second thing is that your soul is very uniquely created by God. What God put on the inside of you and who you truly are has been uniquely designed by God. There's no two persons in this building that are exactly alike. Millions of snowflakes fall, but no two are exactly alike. There's no two people in this building. Maybe they have similar characteristics. Maybe they have similar appearances. Maybe they have similar personalities. But in the end, they're not alike at all because all of us are uniquely created by God. God has placed a very special design upon every man, woman, boy, and girl in this building. We should never practice to be a cookie cutter. We should never want to be like someone else except Jesus. We want to mimic our life after him. We want to follow him. We want to design our eternity after him. The soul that you have today will stand before God one day carrying the body that you're living in now and you will stand before God and give an account to God for all of the life that you have lived and one of the questions will be asked you, of all that you have, what did you trade your soul for? Did you trade it for a person? Did you trade it for things? 
I read in the Bible one man that traded his soul for a little food when his body was hungry. I read of others who traded it for far less. I want to tell you this morning that our life can be taken into the presence of God in a very quick moment. And it could happen before this service comes to an end today. And should that happen to you, what have you exchanged for your soul? What have you traded your life and your eternity for? What have you allowed to become so dear to you that you were not willing to sell out completely and totally over to God? The worth of your soul, the worth of your salvation, the worth of your experience with God. What will it benefit you at the end of this life if you have the best automobile that was created? Or if you live in the biggest home that's ever been built? Or if you have the largest bank account and you could go down with some of those that are worth millions and billions of dollars and die in greatness in the world, but your soul would be far from God. It's not that the wealthy cannot be saved, but it is a fact that oftentimes we sell ourselves, and some sell themselves far cheaper than great wealth. They sell themselves for very little. We've got to value our soul above everything else that we have. I want my eternal existence, my soul, I want to look at that instead of the temporary abode of the body. I realize I've been here for a long time by man's estimation. I look back through here and the oldest among us, I guess, would be Harley, and he is 93. And if he were to look back over the years, he would tell, just like us, I got here in a moment of time. We got here quicker than I would have ever dreamed, ever thought. Those of you that are in your 20s or teens or even your 30s, you'll blink your eyes a few times and turn around and that suddenly will be 50s and 60s. And you won't know how you got there so quickly and others of you will never get there. Others of you may leave this walk of life in your teens or in your 20s and you may leave here unexpectedly in a moment of time. And in a time that you stand before God, the question will be asked, what did you give in exchange for your soul? What did it take to buy you out that you would not serve God and live for God? The soul this morning is eternal. The Bible tells us in the book of uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 16 this morning. You see, the soul is eternal. The inner part of you is an eternal being. Paul writes and he says this, that though the outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed day by day. The outward man is perishing. Wrinkles begin to show in our face. Gray begins to show in our hair. Our step is not quite as frisky as it once was. Our conversation is not quite as quick as it once was. And all of a sudden, things begin to leave us. But while that is happening, there is an inner man that is renewing itself. It never grows old because it's created to be eternal. The inside of a man will live forever and forever. We are here today. My body will soon be gone, but my spirit will never cease. My soul will never end. I will return back to God who gave it to me, and the God who breathed the breath into the body will call me into his positioning. I want to be ready. I don't want to have sold myself out. My speaker last night said, I don't want to sell out my truth for some little something. I don't want to sell out the truth of God just because it pleases somebody. I want to hang on to every word that God has spoken. I want to take that word and I want to hold that affectionately in my spirit. I want to say with God and with all that have worked with God and lived for God through the years, there is no passion, there is no thrill, no excitement that outweighs the beauty and the commitment of a devotion to the Word of God. What has God said unto you? Though the outward man perishes, we love the outward man and we want it to stay here forever, though that's impossible. But the inner man that is renewing itself is just waiting for the next step, the next adventure, the next stroll into eternity, into the presence of God. I live my day today in the body, separated from God only because I'm in this body. But one day the body will dissolve away 
and then I get to go to be with my Creator. What a day that will be. Songwriter said, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon His face, the one that saved me by His grace, there's nothing more marvelous than what's awaiting us. <clears throat> Though the outward man perishes, the inward man renews itself day by day. Verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us. I want you to notice those words, it works for us. The things we go through in life that we think that are very hard, in the, in the weight of eternity, it's called light afflictions. Look at Paul's life. Look at the suffering and the hurt and the bitterness and the pain. His rejections and, and beatings and, and all the things that he went through. And he said, in all of this, I will have to call them light afflictions in the weight of the glory that's coming to me in eternity. My light afflictions, he said, they work a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When I look at all those things that mount up, all the things, the hurts, the pains, the rejections, the walk away, the friends that leave, the things that happen, the things that crush our hearts, the things that makes our spirit bitter. In the weight of all of that, the Bible said it is light afflictions that whenever we put them in comparison to the weight of the glory of God that comes from them, they're simply light afflictions and they work for us. It is not just the good things that makes us better, it's the bad things that make us better. It's not just the victories that makes us stronger, sometimes it's the defeats that make us stronger. Step by step, I walk with Him. Step by step, I know Him greater than I've ever known Him before. Verse 18 says this, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. I'm not looking at the things which are seen, but I'm looking at the things that are not seen. When I look at the things that are seen, I see buildings that deteriorate. I see cars that are beautiful today, and in five years they're ready for a salvage yard. I see things that come and things that go. I see finances in one person's life that vanish away in a moment of time. I see a lot of things that, that happen in men's life that are seen. But there is something that is happening in the world that is not seen. Something that is happening to the inner man, the inner life, the inner spirit, the inner glow of the power of God. What would you give in exchange for your soul? There are people sitting on this pew here this morning. They're on your seats that you've exchanged your soul. You still go to church. You still go to church and you might clap your hands occasionally and do a few things. But you know in your heart that the very glory that once you experienced with God has vanished long ago. The spirit and the life of Jesus Christ that you knew the moment when you bowed your knee in the presence of God and said yes to him and he walked into your spirit, that glory is no longer there. And God is saying, what's wrong? Because while the outward man is perishing, it's not a time to relax and sit back. It's a time to realize there is a life inside of you that's got to renew and renew and renew and renew. And renew means to be made new over again. Your life with God is not a permanent situation. It's a day-to-day -day relationship. Paul said, I've got to die daily. Every day I've got to come into the presence of God saying, God, my flesh is weak, but my spirit is willing. If I've obeyed the weakness of the flesh, it would not be long until I would not know God at all. But if I'm willing to die to the hungers and the desires of the flesh, I can live because in order to live, I've got to die. Amen. In order to have life, I am walking dead man until the life of Jesus Christ comes into me. And that doesn't come until I say yes to him, take control, take control. Liberty, God, take your life. Let your life become my life. And when I submit to him, hope comes, life comes, and I find a renewal in him that I cannot find elsewhere. God, don't let me sell my relationship with you. Don't let me sell out in my commitment and dedication because I realize the soul is eternal. The body is temporal. I'm not looking at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen. 
if your eyes could be opened to see the things that are not seen, your eyes would suddenly behold angels of God because I believe they encompass the people of God. And wherever the people of God are, they are there to be summoned by you and to be invited into your presence and to be invited to help into your life. We are wonderfully, marvelously created of God. The things which are seen, he said, are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I can't see Jesus yet, but when I do see him, I will see the eternal existence of God. I will not see a part of God. I will see total God. I will not walk into a moment of manifestation. I will walk into a moment of eternal revelation. I will see him in ways that I have never seen him before. What would you give in exchange for your soul? I could tell you that some of you have sold out far too cheap. You could have gotten a lot more if you're willing to serve the devil, if you're willing to serve sin. And that doesn't mean that you've got to be the worst guy on the block to be serving sin. It just means that you are not obeying God, that you're not doing what God asks you to do. I want to ask you this question. When it comes a time that you stand before God and your children are standing beside you and you know that you have not taught them the right way, there's more than bringing them to church. The church can't counteract in one hour a week what the devil does to them throughout the rest of the week. The church doesn't have the power in a moment of time to transform their life and to take away all the evil that the world around them is offering them. The world is imposing upon them with all kinds of spirits in, worlds, in the world that cannot be seen. There are spirits attacking the people of God. There are spirits attacking the church. There are spirits attacking our young people. Spirits out there everywhere. We can't see them, but they are there. I don't see angels, but they are here. I don't know where they're sitting, but they're here. But I also know this, in Revelation it said, when it's speaking to the seven churches of Asia Minor, he said, I know where Satan's seat is. That means that wherever the people of God assemble together, the enemy is there too. He's there to distract. He's there to offer you something. He's there to say to you when you feel the convicting power of God that would say to you, you need to go forward, you need to submit, you need to commit yourself to God, you need to totally surrender and live for God all the days of your life. And the devil all of a sudden brings back pictures of things in the world and says, but you'd have to give up this. That's the enemy of your soul sitting next to you that would try to prevent you from being what God wants you to be. What will you give in exchange for your soul? It's a trade-out this morning. Jesus gave a lot for your soul. He gave his life at Calvary. He gave his back to, the, to those that beat the scars upon them. He went through lacerations, mutilation, all kinds of things in order to bring you the eternal gift of salvation. Though the outward man perishes, there is on the inside of you an eternal man. The body is just temporal. It's only for a little time. James 4.14 says this. It says, what is life? What a question. What is life? What is your life? What are, what's making up your life this morning? Is it getting up and and enjoying the pleasures? Is it the next golf game, or is it the, the next ball game, or is it the whatever? You know what? In the sum of things, it doesn't matter who's the best ball player. In the sum of things, it doesn't matter if it's U of L or U of K that wins the next event. In the sum of things, the only thing that really matters, have I paid the price to live for God and be ready if the trumpet of God sounds? What have you given in exchange for your soul? Christ is going to return. And when he returns, he's coming only for those that have made themselves ready. I can't make you ready. I can't offer anything to make you any better off than you are. All I can do is preach to you the truth, and it's up to you to obey the truth of God. I could tell you that men everywhere need to repent of their sin. That means bow down before God and pour your heart out to God and say, God, I'm ready to serve you. I'm ready to live for you. 
I can't do that for you. I wish I could. I'd do it today for every person in this building. But I can't do that for you. But what I can do, I can point you to one who loves you more than you've ever been loved before, cares more about you than anybody's ever cared for you. I can tell you about a Savior whose name is Jesus who did not withdraw anything but paid total price and total submission in order that you might be saved. What is your life? He said, it's just a vapor. It appears for a little season, then vanishes away. We're all in the vanishing process. Some of us has lost people that are older. We've lost people that are younger. We've lost people that were dear to us. There was born in our family four siblings. There's none left but me. I was the oldest. I should have not been the one to live the least. But they began to go away, and they began to pass on from life. What is your life? It's just a vapor. It appears for a little season and then vanishes away. The question that remains and the most attention should be given unto something and should I give more attention to my soul or to my body? Oh, if you were to get up in the morning and find a knot had come out on your body, you immediately would go to the doctor because you want to give the body all the attention that you can. If you were to find something that was abnormal that you knew was not a part of your existence last week or last month, you would go and have that checked because that's just the normal thing to do. I want to ask you, what about the soul? When you find yourself in a position to where less of God satisfies you than it took last year or the year before or 10 years ago, when you find yourself in that position, do you go to the doctor whose name is Jesus and say, hey, guy, we got to work out something here. Something has got to change in my life. I've withdrawn. Life is but a vapor, appears for a little season, and vanishes away. Do I need to give the most attention to my soul or to my body? And I believe the question can be answered very easily. It needs to go to our soul. Maybe like the old guy with the two dogs in Alaska that he would take them every day and every weekend into some community and he would travel them around to communities and, and he would let those dogs fight and people would, buy, would bet on which dog was going to win. Well, years passed by and he'd take those dogs and one day the white dog would win and the next day the black dog would win. After the dogs had grown old and had died and were gone, the man was in the town and a person in the township said, Sir, I need to ask you a question. Now, you had two dogs. Those dogs were both skillful fighters and they loved to fight. And you would bring them in and we would bet on who was going to win. You too would bet on who was going to win. Most of the time we might end up losing, but you never missed which dog was going to win. I said, Sir, how did you know which dog was going to win and which dog was going to lose? Uh, to lose. And he said, oh, that was easy. I always bet on the dog that I fed that week because I knew he was going to be the winner. In this building this morning, you are feeding something. You're either feeding the hunger, the ambitions, the desires of the flesh, or you're feeding the inner man that's going to live forever. Whatever you're feeding the most is what's going to have the most strength and what's going to live the longest. I want to give my life to God. Whatever you feed the most is going to be the stronger part of you. Will it be a part that lives forever or will it be the body that will only live for a short few years? Here's the way Jesus addressed that. I wouldn't have thought of saying it this way, but he said it in Matthew 5 verse 29 beginning. If the right eye offend thee, pluck it out. He said, for it is, profit, it is profitable for thee that one of the members should perish than it would be for the whole body to perish in hell. It would be better, he said in one occasion, to cut off a hand if the hand offend you than to have the whole body to go into hell for it's better to lose one member than to lose it all in eternity. He is saying to you this, what is it that is most important to you that you're allowing it to be the offense of your walk with God and keeping you from being all that you want to be in God? What is it that you're not willing to give up? Is it someone 
that you really know that you don't need to be in that relationship? Is it that promiscuousness? Is it, uh, is it maybe uh, the pornography? Is it maybe just habits or addictions or things? What is it that is keeping you from totally giving up to Jesus? One day Christ is going to come and at the time of his coming it will make absolutely no difference what you have testified to, what you have said to, or how many times you've darted through the door of the church. It will be the dedication and commitment and how you've surrendered yourself to God. God, I bring my soul to you because I hunger for you. I want to live with you. I've got to serve God. He said in verse 30, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. It's way more profitable, he said, for you that your members perish than for the whole body should be cast into hell. I could tell you one thing, I don't want to go to hell. I could tell you one thing that there isn't any question about. I don't want to live for myself and not for God and end up burning in eternity and eternity and eternity. This is not something for a moment of time. It's not for a 1,000 years or 10,000 years. It is for an eon of time in eternity that you'll never understand until you get there because we don't understand eternity. But it's still real. It is a place where the smoke of their torment will ascend up forever and forever and forever. It's not for a moment of time. It's for a duration of eternity. Whatever you're going through today, whatever is happening in your life and whatever is not happening in your life, whatever it is that you're having trouble to give up or to walk away from and say, I've got to walk away from whatever in order to serve God, hear what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and verse 12. He said to me, Paul quoting what God was speaking into his spirit, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you're in this building today and you're saying, you know, I'd like to give this up. I would like to walk away from an addiction. I'd like to walk away from this sin. I'd like to walk away from this wrong. But your inner self is saying, oh, I just can't. God is saying, my grace is big enough. If you'll commit yourself into the grace of God, my grace is big enough, and I will give you strength, and I'll give you help, and your strength will be made perfect if you'll come and surrender it to me. Hallelujah. You can do it. Now, verse 12, he said this, Therefore take pleasure. Therefore I take pleasure. Now he's talking about therefore meaning whatever he had said before. God's grace is sufficient. When I'm walking through a trial and I say I just cannot serve God at this moment in my life, God is saying my grace is sufficient. In your weakness, God's strength is perfected. God has the answer. Let me tell you something. When it comes a time to stand before God, it doesn't matter what your excuses are. God will not be there to tally your excuses. The life you're living today is a life that you're approving for your children. It's a life that you're telling them is okay. So when you live that life, expect them to live the same life. But somewhere in eternity, be expected to answer to God for why you took them down that road. Because the time will come that you will face Him. I will meet God, you will meet God, and we all will meet God. But I want to tell you that heaven is never made for sin. God is opposed to it. And sin separates man's soul from God. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says this. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins has hid his face from you that he will not hear. You could pray, but as long as you're willing to stay in sin, God won't hear it. God will not hear it because he said, my face is hidden from you because of sin. Submit yourself to God. Live for God. Yield to God. See what God has for you in eternity. Because of sin, a wall has been built between you and God. 
What made it possible for man's soul to be brought back to God was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. You can't abuse that. You can't misuse that. You can't walk away from that. You've got to say yes to God. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And he could be quicker than what you think. Should Jesus come now, are you ready? Should Jesus at this moment declare the angels to lift the trumpet and prepare to sound, are you ready? <coughs> are you ready to hear him say, well done? Jeremy comes to the music for me. The Bible says to us in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from the vain conversation. Conversation here means conduct. From the vain conduct received by the tradition of your fathers. What are you saying to me in this verse is this. We already know the answer to this. You can't buy salvation with your silver and gold. You can't do anything. I could give my body to be burned but that won't offer any help to my eternal salvation. If I'm going to be saved, I've got to come God's way. You're not redeemed by corruptible things of silver and of gold. I would this morning that I could just wrap my arms around my family and my grandkids and, and all of my family and I could just love them the way that I want to love them and say to them, we're going to go to heaven together. And I'm not going to let you perish, but all I can do is pray for them. All I can do is tell them of the power of the love of God and say that you can't be redeemed by anything except the blood, the precious, precious blood. You've got to come through the Lamb of God. You've got to come through the Savior of the world. Verse 19 said, Though you cannot be redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood, blood of Christ, the costly, the prized blood of Jesus, the treasured blood of Jesus, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He came. He's our sacrifice. He's my eternal destiny. God, I speak healing over this body this morning. I speak life into this congregation. I speak new worship. I speak new day, new hope. God, I speak here this morning that, that we will understand that in all of our getting, nothing is important to us except the precious blood. Oh, God, I submit myself to you, and I commit this congregation to you, Lord. I love this group of people and, and I know that you love them. You love them so much that you died for them because you did not want them to perish. You wanted them to know the marvel of your salvation and the touch of your eternal spirit. God, I pray healing to the soul, healing to the spirit, healing to the bodies. Reach out here this morning and touch them. As we stand in this building this morning, I'm going to ask you, there are people that need something from God and there's people here that want to pray for you to get something from God. And what we're going to do, we're going to all come right now together. Come on. We're going to come all right now together and we're not going to let you feel a discriminating force that they're making me look like I'm a bad guy. I want you just to come and I want you to begin to pour your heart out to God. God, I want my soul to be ready. I'm willing to leave sin. I'm willing to make my sin right in order that I might be saved. Jesus, healing flow over this place with healing. Healing to our minds, healing to our spirit. Oh, Lord God, I love you more. I love you more. I love you more. You are so wonderful. Not by silver, not by gold, but by the precious blood. By the precious blood. Oh, God, I love you. Flow over these people, God. Flow among them with your glory. Let the eternal presence of your spirit anoint them, God, as never before. 
Let new life, let new hope, let new being come into their spirits. Oh, yes. Lord Jesus, how we love you, Jesus. How we love you, Jesus. Without him. Somebody needs to be praying over here. Some people need to be praying. Praying people need to be moving in here. Oh, God, we need the touch of Jesus. We need the touch of Jesus. We need the touch of Jesus. Oh, God, how we need you, Lord. seasoning of the Holy Spirit. Yes, God, you're a sweet-smelling Savior. Oh, God, and without you, I surely fail. Like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? God, I love you. somewhere oh yes with the angels in heaven or the demons in hell you've got to live we've all got to live forever somewhere
hope today that you'll go home to your homes and you'll stop and you'll ask yourself, am I really ready to meet God? I mean, it's easy to say that and to try to convince yourself, but you need to ask yourself sincerely and from the depth of your spirit, am I prepared? If Jesus came today, am I ready? And if there's any question in your mind, in your heart, your spirit about whether or not you're ready. And I'm going to tell you, this is not this thing of join the church of your choice and because there's no church can save you. This is not about some church saving you. And this is not about some church saying, if you got it, when I, I had an uncle. Didn't live for God a day in his entire life that I knew of. When I would talk to him about God, he would say, you don't understand. When I was a little boy, nine years old, down that south church, I walked down the aisle and gave my life to God, and I'm ready to go. Lived his life as an alcoholic. Lived his life without God, lived his life and died without God, declaring, I know I'm ready to go because when I was a nine-year-old boy, I'm going to tell you something, it'll hold on from nine to 90, but you got to keep it. You got to keep it. You can't play with God. You can't play around with God. This is the most serious matter you've ever dealt with in your whole life. I've got to be ready. I've got to be ready. I want to be ready. Hallelujah. I want to be ready. I appreciate the blessings of God this morning. I, I love you people. I, I love you people. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless all of you. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed. Praise God. Oh, here. Our ushers are going to come up now and take up uh, Pastor Appreciation offering.